Hello everybody, how are we all doing? So I've been given the, the task of filling in between this morning's presentations and lunch, which is always a killer position, isn't it? Because you either want me to go quick, because you need your lunch, and also my lunch usually happens at 12 o'clock, so it's a little bit, we're a little bit on borrowed time here. I'm halfway through my lunch already. Um, so as I said, a lot of you people are probably saying, GE Power, what on earth are you doing here? In the wrong conference, wrong show. Well, actually, it's interesting to say that actually telecoms is principal to what we do at General Electric. Um, and now how is that? You'll say, oh, we've got a couple of stragglers coming in. Sit at the front, I'm afraid, guys. You've got to sit at the front if you're last in. <laughs> so I don't know, um, do you know Alexander Graham Bell? Anybody? Ring any, no, ring any bells? Personally. Ring any bells? <laughs> so, <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell, when he invented the telephone, um, was trying to come up with a call sign for how you, uh, how you address people when you pick up this new telephone thing. So um, he was a maritime guy, and he thought it would be good to answer the phone going, Ahoy, ahoy. Um, so I'm not quite so sure how that, that would work in modern day, but that's what he was going for. But he was, at the time, getting advice to, to how he was going to take this telephone thing to the market from someone else who works in my business. So he was actually mentored by Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, who'd recently got the light bulb into mass production, he was helping our good friend Alexander Graham Bell get the phone in there. And in conversation with one of the guys, he actually said, you know, ahoy ahoy's probably not right. Have you, maybe try the word hello. So actually, Thomas Edison is <laughs> introduced the word hello into modern vocabulary, because that is the way you address people on the phone now, is hello. Previously, it was hello with a U. But that's where it comes from. This is why GE are involved in telephones, because we in <laughs> helped use the word hello. But that's obviously a tenuous link into my presentation today, just to break the ice a little bit and go back to the man who invented the light bulb and the telephone, um, to say where I come from. So another day, another name. I'm no longer GE Power. I'm now GE Vanova. If you want to know the details of that, come and see me afterwards. I won't explain it now. But what are we? We're a large American company that bought a lot of companies over the years. Now, my company, Small World, who I work with and have worked with for 20 years, um, were invented by an entrepreneur in Cambridge, uh, Dick Newell, who set up the company. And he set up for a company to do this new stuff that was around. Um, he'd worked a lot in CAD, computer-aided design. But there was this new thing called GIS, Geographical Information Systems. So this was taking maps, putting a database behind it, and generating insights into how you could put networks against those things. So we work globally with companies that use our, our GIS and our inventory management capabilities to allow them to model and map their networks. So really, the thing I'm bringing today is to talk to you about how we can use automation, how things have changed year on year, what's new, and also some of the data schemes. Now, our company started 30 years ago when it was pretty much just, you know, maps. But nowadays, there's a lot more data out there. Everyone's collecting data. Even if you walk around a corner, someone's collecting data on you. There's photographs taken. There's data collected in huge, huge silos of data because we've collected it because we think we need to. Okay, you think you need to collect it, but what are you going to do with it? How are you going to turn it into value? How are you going to use that to inform your decision making? So if we look at this, it's very much like a recipe or a cake. We always start at the bottom. You've got to have something at the bottom of your cake to build upon. And actually, for what I do, mapping is the base for what we work to. So that's the backing of the digital twin. And accuracy really does matter. Now we go back to this. This is the time of the Ordnance Survey. Who, Ordnance Survey, anyone here from the Ordnance Survey? Oh, you're not from the Ordnance Survey. So back in the 1940s, they went through a, a very large scale digitization of the country. So they had lots of people going around looking for reference points which they could then build a map from. Now look at that in the 1940s. Accuracy matters. There's a fella with a white arrow, a board in his hand with some information about it, and that's the reference point. But that is the reference point to which they then built the area, the map for the local area on. This was in Manchester, and actually they went around taking photographs of these guys so that they could actually have a photographic representation of where that location was. But let's bring that to the modern day. You don't see people taking photographs of, you know, pointing at little bits of road. Lots of people who model their assets and model their telecommunication, <laughs> telecommunication, easy for me to say, telecommunication networks using GPS. So GPS is across the market everywhere. Lots of people are starting to use GPS to exactly model to the millimeter where their things are. And they want to keep that information to show where it is. But having that information of where things are, where things reference to, 
doesn't really help if you haven't got a good background. Now, we work with companies globally, but I've got to say, I like the fact that I work in the UK where we have the Ordnance Survey. The Ordnance Survey is one of the best reference maps I've seen globally. And as a baseline for what we do, it's fantastic. You know, it's been, it's been 270 years in the making. You know, they, were, they were mapping the uh, Scottish uprisings 200 years ago, and that's the origination of the Ordnance Survey. But now, the mo modern maps, the master maps, etc., allow you to have a seamless view of your, your map and your network. So what does that say? You know, all of this stuff is incredibly accurate. You can see exactly where things are. When I started in GIS, we didn't necessarily use other sources of data, but we used referential information, uh, a poll or something. Um, for your network, which is the geospatial stuff we put on the overlay there, where is it? It's outside number 22, the Crescent. It's outside number 16, Mill Road. It's on the corner of, it's nearby. But nowadays, a lot of the, the information is held within these information management systems that allow you to access more and more information on your network. So you'll see the second layer we've put on there. So the second layer of the cake is the inventory management system that goes on top. So where is my network? It was interesting that the, the barn guys talking about how their network gets put on a map and how they manage that, how they work with the local communities to build that, that view. Obviously, you can see where it goes. You can plan these things. That's just what the maps are used for. But other maps have arrived. So other maps are there. Google. Everyone uses Google nowadays. When I turn my phone on, I go straight to Google Maps. I don't go to the Ordnance Survey, unfortunately. But that's a different data set. We've now got a new mapping system we can look at. Now, I go back to the lady there nodding about the Ordnance Survey. Is I still go back to the Ordnance Survey. It's the most accurate. This is brilliant for referential, for address management, for looking for things, for going to places quickly. Address searching something in Google is so easy. Looking for the nearest Costa when you're out attending a splice or you're making a change in your network. You can use this reference information and the multi data sets to enable you to look around where you are. So these two things work together. They don't oppose each other. They work together and they're complementary data sets. Now that's talking about the base layers that we've got of how you model your network. So there's obviously more comes into play when you're looking about building a network. I mean, all, we're all here to talk about building <coughs> networks. Whether you're a brownfield, whether you're greenfield, when you're a tier one, you're a tier two, you're an altnet, you're a community network, you, you know, what are you? All of these types of things influence how you want to use your geospatial information. You want to be able to use it to the best of the benefit because you want to be building the best network for your end customers. It was interesting in the first presentation, the race to sell, we call it. How quickly can I get network out there, get people online, get people connected to the network? So we're again lucky in the UK. And I know it's quite odd that when you see people reference PIA, open reach, actually, a lot of countries don't have that. So I work with a, a number of companies in, in different territories that don't have this information. So the ability to build quickly doesn't exist. The tier one operators exist, but they don't necessarily give out the data. So three or four years ago, when they opened up the information on the PIA network, meant a lot of altnets could set up in the UK. I think we number about 150, 170 at a rough estimate. Altnets that are leveraging the PIA data to number one, connect customers, but to two, to drive down the overall cost of build, and three, to actually you know, use the network that's actually out there already. Why would you dig up the road when you can just use the network that's already there? So in terms of that layers of data, bringing data in, we obviously were able to bring this data in, and not just RGIS, all companies sort of do this sort of thing, but bringing that data in is great, because then you've got your network you can model on. Now what we can do here, you can see on this map on the right hand side, you can color code it. There's a RAG status on the PIA data. So we can infer information from that data and then generate a new insight into that. And this helps a lot with strategic planning, area management, where you're going to go. Because actually, if you've got a lot of red in there, you can have a lot of survey, you can have a lot of broken ducks, and you've probably a load of missing poles. But the point is that you can then use that data to inform your decision about where you go, where you best optimize your network, how you plan it, how you orchestrate, how you roll it out. And then notice of intent management. This is unbelievable. We work with companies that have numbers of people managing NOIs manually. Why would you do that? Automate it in a system, push the data back through the APIs that BT publish, and away you go. So we're working very closely with companies that want to leverage this data because it really is optimizing how they run out, how they run out, how they roll out their networks. 
And it is, well, I think UK, we are ahead of a lot of other countries. So I've talked about the flat map. When I started in my career, I was actually digitizing networks for an electricity company. But actually, I was sat there copying things off a map into a GIS. Roll forward 20 years, there's more data available. Google didn't exist when I started. I know it's hard to believe. I don't look as old as I really am. Um, but Google now exists. iPhones exist. And actually, a lot of people are now starting to leverage and use newer technologies. So using things like images to support how they work. I call this rainy day planning. And all the planners that I talk to say that's not true. They don't. They always go out in the rain. It's fine. But they don't. So we do things like working with companies to then use Google. Because you look at this as a different data set. People can use Google imagery to do survey address validation without leaving the office. So in this example, you can see there's two addresses there that appear to be in the same location, 145 to 147. By simply looking on Google, you can see there's two addresses there. There's two businesses to be served. So actually, there's two address points to go to there. So really enabling people to just use the geospatial map as well as the, the, the photographic information means you can quickly make a decision on we need to do two drops to that place. We don't need just a single drop. This is easily served. Some of the other things we look at is the survey, the surfacing. I know, of course, you know, digging a field is a lower cost than digging up the middle of Cambridge. So I'm from Cambridge. Um, so this is an example of where you've got some challenges with survey, um, with actual surface analysis. I mean, look at that. Outside King's College, number one issue. I don't think the university are going to let you dig up there. But you've got a combination of paving stones, cobbles, tarmac. What's your optimum route to go down there? Straight down the middle of the road. <laughs> Close off the city centre, straight down the middle of the road. But really, this is something that really builds into how you organise your network and how you cost your network. At the strategic analysis level, you want to understand this. You know, is it worthwhile going up King's Parade to put a network, or should I maybe go around another way? Should I provide an alternate service or an alternate route? The other thing we like to see is, um, and this refers to the PIA stuff as well, is actually, is the equipment actually there? Who knows? I've got a registration from a map that shows me it's there. But if you look on the map on the corner there, you can see there is, there is a, supposed to be a cabinet, but you can see in the real world there's two cabinets and an underground box in the ground. So something's wrong. Is my data wrong? Or actually in the real world, that cabinet on the left-hand side, number 12, has got nothing inside of it. I know that because it's around the corner from where I work and the door opens and I can look inside. So these are the things that allow you to actually go without having to ask me to go and look in that cabinet to see there's nothing inside. You can use your, th your imagery to then help you see what is actually there, what's there, and inform your planning process. If we then get a little bit further forward into the process, these, these images are available over time. This is the beauty. Everyone's taking a photo. Who's taking a photo today? See, look, we're all taking photos of what? People standing in front of a projector talking. <laughs> we can use those as referential information going forward. So if you capture images over time, you can go back and say, actually, what happened before is different to what you're telling me. So in this instance, you've got an example of a customer complaint. When you dug up my road, you didn't put it back to how it was supposed to be. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did, because that's what it was like before. That's what it's like now. Come and complain. OK, well, this is the beauty. You, know, you can see the before and the afters. This is now starting to build data. Again, we're looking at data over time. But it's available in different ways. And the fact that someone parked that Citroen car or whatever is at the top makes that photo look older than the one at the, the other side. So again, time stamping is very useful for these things. And then time, how things change. We all like change. Everyone talks about change. Change happens everywhere. Change happens all the time. But look, here you can see a lovely little road with a nice little garage on it, which got knocked down. <laughs> it disappeared. Oh my god, what's going on there? Well, actually, they built a massive block of flats. So actually, what you can do there is you can use data over time. You can see that there is a new opportunity for sale. There's a new block of flats going in there. You can then work with the developers to put the network in first before you have to go and retrospectively put these things in. So actually using this type of data means that you can keep track with how things are going. There are vans that drive around collecting this data. There are Google vans driving around. People can build this data themselves. They can buy vans and do it themselves. But really, this does help understand how things change over time and how your network has to evolve to meet the needs of your changing customer base. 
And then we go to the next level of Google. I know a lot of people don't know there's a next level of Google, but there is. It's a thing called LiDAR. So LiDAR is a means by which, similar to photogrammetry, but it's actually a laser that fires out from these cars driving around places to make an accurate model of what's driving past. So actually, you can take measurements from these things. It's not just like a flat image in Google. You can actually use this LiDAR data. LiDAR data is, there's some very good coverage in Belgium, Netherlands, etc. It's a growing data set. These people, these companies come and do LiDAR assessments for you. But the ability to measure from a map on the left-hand side there to know how long that drop is, is an instant bit of correct information. Not an assumed bit of information. You can actually base your decision making on that. It is exactly 11.2 meters, because it is. On the right-hand side, you can see that you don't have to go and dig twice, because you know where the cabin is. It's exactly 1.6 meters from the box. Was it 1.6? Yes, 1.6 meters from the box to the cabinet. You know these things, so you're collecting more and more accurate data. This is one of my favorite examples of permits. Who does permitting? One person does permitting. Uh, I'll just talk to you then on this one. <laughs> the, so this is an example uh, which really helped in um, a time of COVID. So in COVID, you weren't allowed to leave your bedroom and your little computer with your little video camera on there and your Teams call. You weren't allowed to go to site because in the history before COVID, you used to go with the town councillor, the local person who owns the house and three or four other people and you stood around and you said, I'm going to put a box here and I need all you people to say, yes, I can put my box here. And then you'll have a cup of tea and they'll look and they'll, um, and they'll say, move it that way, move it this way, move it that way. No, in COVID, you couldn't do that. So combining LiDAR data with 3D representations of that, you can see the, the box location. That is an exact location for that box. That box is exactly sized to match where it will go. Jump on a Teams call. You can agree on the phone in half an hour that that box can go there rather than an entire morning chatting with local councillors, bribing them with cups of tea. This company could do eight of these a day, where previously they could do one or two. There's a massive optimization saving there by using the data in a different way to then you know, fix a problem that doesn't exist. Now that COVID's finished, we're not going back to the old way of doing it. They're carrying on doing it this way because this is the most optimal way for them to get permits approved. The other thing is, so just to close off this little section on imaging, is of course, thumbs up to street level mapping. It's only been around 10 years, probably. Yeah, you can use it all the time. The worst thing about it though, is it can catch you out because that happens to be me and that's not my wife. <laughs> so on the internet is a picture of me thumbing up to a Google car which I thought was hilarious, but my wife asked me, who was that? And that was <laughs> uh, awkward. So that's our little secret, okay? I have to keep that quiet. I didn't have a beard in those days either. Anyway, design automation is the next thing. So once you've got a map, let's do something different. Let's do something with automation. There are clever people out there writing clever algorithms that can do network models for you. So what does it do? It goes back, it uses this fantastic Ordman survey stuff that we've got and can generate for you a layout of your network. Now, olden days, you'd have a fella driving, driving, drawing lines down the road in a CAD system, in an inventory management system. This thing takes the data you've got, allows you to run it through an algorithm and then draw in data. So it draws in your demand points. It draws in your existing network. It drags in your PIA network. It means that you can then use that infrastructure, reusing the infrastructure, you can use it to then lay out your network. You'll see here, what it's done is it's just made a boundary down the river, river road center line. And then you can then put your ducks down the side of that. This doesn't replace the planner though. So a lot of organizations we work with go, hang on though, my planners would do that differently. I know they would, because they're not an algorithm in a computer. But this can do 90% of the legwork for you in dense urban areas, as well as rural areas. This isn't just something that gets used for, for dense things, uh, for city planning, it can be used everywhere, but really does step you forward in terms of analyzing how it can be and run simulations of different models of layout. It was interesting, the barn guys were saying, you know, they're 100% penetration because that's their business model, that's the, where they want to go. And other organizations go, well, I've only bothered about 80% penetration, so run me a model, what's it look like to meet 80% of those people? And also you can use this for large-scale simulation. 
So um, models like this have been used for a customer we have in Ireland who's rolling out to all of rural Ireland. They ran a model across all of Ireland. How much would it cost to deliver to everyone in Ireland? There's all the demand points. There's everybody in Ireland. Give me a number. So this really helps. It doesn't replace the planner. It supports the planner and gives them different propensities to work in different ways because they just do the tweaking, adding the value on the top, the cream on the cake. Um, automatic drop creation, you know that? Gee, can you imagine having to draw all those in day in, day out? Nightmare, takes forever. Just get a computer to do it. Spend your time doing something much better, much more useful. Group things together. All the drops are grouped together into little areas, demand points, central offices, all those types of things. It just works as a standard to move forward. And I'm not saying it works for everybody. Organisationally, people can adopt these things, people can take these things on, others can't because they're different diff business models, different needs. So actually it's about building the business model and the need to then make sure you've got the right tool in place to support your network rollout. And if we just look at numbers here, just a couple of customer references. So Deutsche Telekom took down 25 days to five days. In a national rollout, that's a huge saving, huge. And again, it doesn't replace all the planners. It doesn't mean the planners are not doing anything. It just means they're more cost effective. They can do more things. They can work more, they can work smarter, not more smarter, <laughs> worst thing to say. And then that, you know, that's a tier one example. A tier two example, up, oh, UK company, Altnet, using automation to design, and they actually managed to take out some of the skills that were required. Rather than using planners, you know, those people that existing expectations on how to lay out a network, they took graduates, they took people who were leaving the army, they trained them up to use the automation tool, the automation tool does 90% of the work for them. They got a massive throughput using an automation tool without having to use as many planners as they originally perceived they would need to. They still have planners because of course instances occur where you need to change these things, your network, there's questions that get resolved by a planner. But these are all about simplifying processes, making sure you're using the right resources and maximizing the, the minimizing sorry the time, the time to sail. The thing we were talking, I think, in the first presentation, the plan, build, sale. That's where we're getting to. Reduce that time in these commercial organizations. Um, so that's, I've whizzed through some data there. I've whizzed through some photogrammetry. I've whizzed through some automation planning. Um, what about mashing data up? So historically, a lot of information stayed in the planning department. <coughs> we're the planning department. It's our planning data. That's where it's staying. Well, no, no, it's useful for more people. We've got a case study here of some of the, the, the work we've done with a, an existing customer up. Here you'll see um, you know, a very similar thing. They're North Norfolk in terms of where they're going for. They wanted lots of penetration. They wanted to be first there. There's a lot of competition in the alt market. Let's not be daft about that. There's a lot of people chucking fiber in the ground, and they're chucking it on top of each other. So they wanted to know how can we get ahead of the competition? How can we get ahead of the people that are already there or moving there? How can we target to sell to the right people? I don't want to be selling to people that don't want my service. I want to make sure I'm putting something in that is of value to that area. Because in these large areas, I think the point we made earlier um, from the guys from Barn, you know, very focused area, but in the bigger areas, they're waiting for someone just to do it. Big urban areas, just put it in, I'll, I'll go for the cheapest. Um, maximize performance, also then keep the people in the network up to date with how things are progressing. Everyone in the, inf in the business should know where they are in the build. Why? Well, why not? If you're customer services or sales, you should know where we are in the build. You should know where you're, where you fit into the process. So the challenges they had were data in multiple systems. So obviously they had multiple systems, they had multiple people delivering data into those. They had lots of people across an organization and it was a growing organization when we started working with them. So there was lots of people coming on expecting to have data available for them day one. Where's my data? How do I get this? Oh, we don't know. It's somewhere. But in a secure way, we don't want data spilling out all over the world. You need to keep it there. And obviously the worst thing you see in an organization is, can I have a copy of that spreadsheet? And then away they go. That data's then lost. It changes. It doesn't come back to the source. Data gets lost, replicated. I remember when I used to work at NTL many, many years ago, I met a fibre splicer, and I was, I was out for a day with a fibre splicer, and he said, oh, Colin, um, do you want to have a look at this? I was like, what? I've got the splice records for all of Nottingham in my car. I don't know who to give them to. What? 
You've got all the splice records for all of Nottingham in your car. <laughs> yes, I have. It's in there. It's in the glove compartment. Out it comes. Massive thing. That data he took out, and he, every job he'd done, he just updated it. That was a source of data that no one in planning knew about. I came back, and it was the golden child. Look what I found. <laughs> um, so, yeah, these are the challenges that many customers face. Many people want to change. So how do we change that? How do we make this better for, uh, for up? So, obviously, we worked with them to make sure that we could put a system in place that would allow them to bring data together in a central place, secure, and standardize it so we could manage change. You can see how things are changing regularly. You don't have to worry about, oh, is it up to date? Jeff, is it up to date? No, it is. It's always up to date because it's available. It's online, self-service. Everyone can go and see the data that they need to to do their job. And this is something that a lot of people miss out on nowadays is, how can I do my job more effectively and how can I get access to tools and data to enable me to do my job? If I have to spend two hours going to find out who's got the piece of data in a large organization like Deutsche Telekom, BT or whoever, you're wasting most of your day chasing things. So by enabling people to have access to these things meant that they could bring together data, smash it together and bring different insight to it. So the data analysts, when they were looking at where they should go to, where they should roll out their network, they took a data set that said, okay, well, where's the competition in these areas? Let's bring that together with my proposed rollout and the postcode information. And let's color it so that we can see where the most attractive areas to go, where there's no competition. If there's no competition there, active, happy days. You can be first to market, you can be first to sale. But that bringing together of data in a single system that enabled them to mash this thing together gave insight. Internet user classification. I think it's quite interesting, you know. It's always great to serve internet to people's houses, but actually they're gonna use it. I know my mum won't. I will use it when I go to my mum's house, but this is another data set. This is a data set mashing together people's propensity to use data. Are they, you can't quite see it on there, it's not as great, but you know, are they mainstream? Are they additional users? Are they veterans? Are they youthful people chasing for the internet? You know, this ability to bring data together then highlights areas where you should be going because you're going to get your return on investment. If you're a company that wants to, you know, build fast, sell fast, then there you go. Go to those areas first. It's information generated from geospatial data. Don't forget it all started with a map in the first instance. We've now put multiple layers on the cake. It's probably about this big with information, but it's really helping an organization change. And then really when we talk about the end-to-end -end life cycle, the plan, design, build, operate thing, is that, okay, well, who's at the very end of that process? In a commercial organization, it's the sales guy. When can I sell to that house? So actually, if you roll all the way back to the build process and the planning process, here's the addresses I planned, and let's put a status on that. Let's feed the information back. When it gets planned, it goes into a status. When it gets built, the status changes. And then let's put that on a map so that you can see where you're going to. So actually, those little spots on there, you'll see the, the little dial down the side, you can see when things are becoming available. So the key is you can send your salespeople out. Go and go to that estate and start selling the hell out of the new network. This was a real big thing for UP because it meant that they could be first to knock on the doors of the houses of the people that would potentially take their service. You know, if you're the second or third in the area knocking on the door, sorry, I've already got the new guy, the new guy that came in and replaced BT. You know, first to market and really accelerate the means by which people can build and sell. There's a couple of things here, because I said everyone in an organization should have access to data. So really, these are the, like, the takeaways from the, the people in the business, the people that now had access to this data. They didn't have access to it before. They waited for a manager to run a spreadsheet and push it through and send it out, and away you go. But no, people could self-serve. It's a big thing in modern day. I want to get to my data as quickly and as easily as I can. So really takeaways there are, you know, make data available for people, bring it together. There's not just one dimensional views on these things. You can have multi-dimensional data aggregation to help people in their job. So what's next? Enhanced visualization of data. This is where we start talking about the futures. I've actually rattled through my slides a lot quicker, but this is what, what we're sort of seeing in, in the future. What's happening? Where are we going? What's coming next? Augmented reality. That's going to be interesting, isn't it? A load of people walking around the street with goggles on, bumping into lampposts. <laughs> so this is a real thing. People are really investing in this. Meta, Lenovo, Google. Google had Google Glasses not long ago. 
These are all things people are starting to look into. Apple next year, you've got a device that comes out that goes on your face for $1,600. That means you can use your Mac without a screen. I can walk down the street with some goggles on. I look like a right idiot. But I, I'm on a FaceTime. Can you be quiet, please? But this is what people are now trying to do. They're trying to introduce contextual awareness for field users. So actually, can you take that flat layer I showed you earlier and bring that into a three-dimensional view where you can see it in front of you? When you open a cabinet door and you look inside the cabinet, it can bring up the visualization of the cabinet. You can see what's there. You can see the customers that are served on a, I'm just about to pull this out. Who am I going to affect? I'm turning the hospital off. Well, don't do that. Put it back in. But these things are, again, about engineering, about people being able to see before construction is a very key area as well. So before I start digging the road, what's actually there? Well, there's a gas cable, there's a gas pipe or an electricity cable just where you're about to dig. So don't dig there. Look for where you want to go in a more contextual way. I mean, is this something people, can you imagine walking around the street with these goggles on? No, but the thing is it probably will come. It probably will come. I don't think I remember a time before the iPhone, but that's here now, and I wouldn't live without it. Um, the funny thing is, though, we have a, a concept of this, and we took it to a show once. It's brilliant, because there was a guy looking in it, and he, he ended up just bending down and hiding like this, because he got lost in his VR world. <laughs> Colin, I'm spinning. I'm spinning, can you help me? So in the future, we'll have a lot of people bumping into stuff in the street and stuck falling into a world of nowhere. But it is coming. These are the things. Innovation does make change. The other thing we're using is things like drones, for example. Drones are great. Rural areas, very good for surveying, very good for looking at these things. We use drones for mobile ta tower management. You'll see here that we've, you'll see that little representation in the middle. That's all the photographs or the LIDAR shots taken by the, the drone flying around the mast. And obviously that then allows you to generate a 3D representation of that. Then you're using different models on that. You can actually run algorithms against it to identify that a bird has started building a nest on it. Now, a lot of people do catch me out on this because they say, well, surely the fella flying the drone could see there was a nest there. So why did you need to fly a drone? But actually, if you look at this in the grander scale of these things, if you look to things like the US in electricity, they have people flying drones down electricity tracks where no one goes to. They can do vegetation management. If you've got an aerial line running the length of America, you can send a drone down it and identify where trees are going to start hitting your electricity network. You know, in a telecommunication context, it's not as real, but we have large expanses of network. There are different things that AI is going to start using. And I think AI, if you're not engaged with AI, it's going to be a very scary place in the future. Because that learning, that data that it's generating, actually really is quite clever because actually you can identify that bird's nest and apply it to all the bird's nests in all the different masts, in all the different locations, in all the world. You can start learning and generating information from these things. And then the last one is a, a, a little bit on AI identification. This is a little bit more real for telcos. So I, I kind of tended to it. When you go to a cabinet in the street, you open it up, you take a photo. That photo is a photo in time of that. That cabinet. Actually, let's extract the information. Because that's a bit of Nokia kit there, so I know what that is. That's a bit of juniper kit. We know what that is. So you can identify what these things are. So large companies that have got lots of information, but their records have degraded over time, a lot of companies are going back and re-evaluating their networks, checking that their asset inventories, their digital twins, are still relevant. Are they still correct? So this enables people to take pictures of things, analyze, yes, OK, that's all the equipment. But other things that we've seen people adopting image analysis in is, is job sign-off. So actually, if you go to a location, you take a photograph before you start your work. OK, I've taken a picture of the inside of a cabinet. Great. I go and do my work. You take another photograph of it. AI tools can then be used to program programmatically look at that and identify the change between the two photos <coughs> and identify what you've done wrong because you've not put the splice tray back in correctly. You've left a little bit of litter at the bottom there because you just unwrapped something and chucked it on the floor. OK, well, you can't sign off your job now until you've removed that litter and you've corrected that splice tray. Because people don't want shoddy work to really be the data that they're building on in the future. So the ability to use these types of tools and these types of information is really becoming the future of our data sets. So not only are we a flat map, not only are we street view, not only are we LIDAR, 
But all those people that put their hands up today to take photos, those photos are the future because the ability to analyze those, those photos really then allow us to make decisions on them. You know, what can we do in the future with these things? Um, so that really is kind of a view to the future, you know. I think a company I spoke to recently, they said, we've got well over a million photos of our entire network. And they're all on a document management system somewhere. <laughs> and we've got them just in case. But actually, what they need is a reason to use it. So hopefully, over time, they'll be able to get value from that asset that they're collecting over time. And we'll be going back to the fella in the field, taking the photo of the the guy taking the reference site, because that was a photo in itself. So we've been relying on photos since the 1940s to bring these things forward. So that's a view on the current, the future, inventory management generally. There's nothing there that isn't agnostic to other people in the business. It's just an oversight of what, what we do, how we've worked with our customers, and how they've grown value over time. So I think we said it was lunchtime at one o'clock, guys. Just, no? You've done your part of this, so now it's up to you. <laughs> Questions? Hello, Tom Brick from Barn. Um, first, I just wanted to show an appreciation for all that work that you've done with UP, because we went through that with Excel, you know, spreadsheets, data in several different pots and linking it all together. It is a mammoth task, but it must be done to operate your business. So first, an appreciation for that. That's amazing. Um, I've got a question about UPRNs, Unique Property Reference Numbers, because I've found out that they're not, not technically unique. And um, we've had trouble securing um, certain funding for okay. uh, properties uh, because UPRN data is mismatched, etc. What's your view on that? Because there's a, you know, a layer of topology that you could look at that shows that here is a, a, an actual building. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you've got decisions being made, quite serious decisions being made on funding, but it's based on things that could change. And we've, we've witnessed over the years that UPRN data um, shifts and, you know, decisions are made on data that could be out of date. Yeah. And we've, we've had so many problems with this. Anyway, what's your view on UPRNs? It's a good question. It's a good question. And UPRNs are problematic, of course, because change happens and you can't guard against that. I mean, we obviously see in our customers, they see these things changing. Categorization of UPRNs, you know, is it a milk shed, is it a traffic light? There are different things that you need to be able to strip out of those. And these things change over time, like addresses do. And yeah, it is a constant challenge. I don't think we can get away from that change because you can't cleanse that massive data set very easily. Um, it, it's very cognizant of the BT network, the PIA network. That's not right either in places. So it's around crowdsourcing and bringing that information together that enables you to then make that change. And yeah, it, it's a pain, not when you have to live with, when we'd like to see change. But I also know your question was answered in my colleague Gillian's presentation that she did at the last lecture set here around addresses. So Gillian also takes a lot of my pain. And also, if I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Gillian, on address management. Yeah, it's, it's a really big problem. It's a big problem for everyone, as was the DIA, which was what I was talking about. Because You've got data that evolves at the, oh, sorry. <laughs> You've got data evolving at different rates. And it's not just in the UK, it's absolutely everywhere. And it's always a problem because addresses the addresses which are supplied by the Ordnance Survey change and they do move substantially, which you'll know. I mean they can be here and then they're like fifty metres down the road the next time they send them out. And and of course there's always new build as well or things being demolished. So um, as I mentioned to you earlier, we're working rural Ireland. Geodirectory are the supplier of addresses over there, and the amount of change is huge. We're working with TDC Net over in Denmark, and they have 800 address updates a day. So when you're designing, one of the most important things to know is, is has there been a change which will impact what you're doing? And the impact will, dif will um, be different depending on what stage you're through. So if it's at the point where you're building, you obviously want to adjust if it's at the point where you've built you need to go and find out about it so uh, working with the guys at GE we put together systems which will allow you to track has something changed which has an impact and alerts the relevant users at the time when it goes on yeah sorry uh, can I respond yeah, 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 yeah. yeah uh, it's an interesting one because we've got a real-world case here of perhaps you can help the government I mean we we were in a situation where we were deploying new network and we receive government funding for connected UPRNs, 
because they use UPRN data. We identified issues with a certain project's UPRN data at a certain point with the government, but it's taken them 18 months to solve it because they've got to go through their compliance and all their processes to get that done. We built the network before. Mm -hmm. um, they've even got the change in the system. So we've actually had to leave people out. So go along a street and you've got a UPRN problem. We've been able to connect a few people and say, now, sorry, problem, problem with the uh, data set, we can't connect you. What do you mean you can't connect us? So if we connect you now, we can't get the funding from the government yeah. and there's a problem with the data set. But you know, we, it's a fast paced world, right? You have daily updates on all these things. We feed that into you know, various different data sets and help the government, but yeah. It's just an industry-wide problem, I think, that it takes so long for these things mm -hmm. to run through the system. It's just too late. You know, we've already built the network. But anyway, just a comment on that situation. No, no, no. Again, a lot of companies feel the same pain. It's not just you. You know, these change, as Gillian says. Happens everywhere. So, Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you talked early on about different um, sources of mapping data. What I keep seeing more and more these days is OpenStreetMap. Mm -hmm. It seems though it's updated quite frequently, all the time. Yep. Is it a good data source? Yes. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> no, uh, there is. There is. So to be honest, there's, there's so many different data sources, and I always go back to the benchmark of you know, Ordnance Survey is generally the best. And then there are variations. OpenStreetMaps is another good one. It's highly accurate. If you go to the realms of Google, the projection systems are all different and it isn't that accurate. So you wouldn't model a network against it. But a number of customers do use OpenStreetMaps as a data reference point. Thank you. Everyone wants lunch, don't they? Everyone wants lunch, don't they? Thank you. <laughs>